Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to Perspectives on Global Justice Program. This is your host Beatrice Cantelmo. Today we have a very special guest, Josie Howard. Josie is a program director for the We Are Oceania. We will be discussing COFA, Compact of Free Association Treaty and Migrant Issues, learn more about the fabulous We Are Oceania organization and about the first Youth Micronesian Summit, which happened on April 15th. However, before we start our show today, I would like to remind our viewers about a very painful part of American history, and in my opinion, one of the biggest human rights injustices of our modern times. Most people are aware of how Hiroshima and Nagasaki were destroyed by American-made nuclear bombs. However, very little attention has been given to the Micronesians and the French Polynesians and how they were impacted by the disastrous consequences of the U.S. military nuclear testing that occurred over the course of 30 years. 180 nuclear bombs were launched in these regions. The first nuclear testing Bikini Auto program was a series of 23 nuclear devices which were detonated by the U.S. between 1946 and 1958 at seven sites over the reef itself and on the sea and the air and underwater. The second series of nuclear tests in 1954 was named Operation Castle. The first detonation, Castle Bravo, happened on March 1st, 1954. The explosion had a destructive capability of more than 1,000 times of the Hiroshima bomb. It was so powerful that they vaporized several small islands. This nuclear test did in fact cause significant environmental and human damage. The people of Micronesia, Palau and Marshall Islands paid the ultimate price and have sacrificed a lot to them. Their lands, air, ocean and health, their culture, their ability to live sustainable lives back home and they were severely compromised by American-made nuclear bombs military practices. Seventeen years later, the story still remains the same. The people who came from these regions continue to suffer and pay the ultimate price, and their health is very impacted. They suffer from cancer, miscarriages, tumors, and birth defects. And with, on that note, I would like to welcome you, Josie, to our program. So honored that you're here. Thank you very much, Patrice. So, mm -hmm. Josie, uh, uh, for our viewers that don't know uh, about you, uh, would mm -hmm. you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about uh, where you come from and your okay. Uh, background? Okay, sure, I can do that. Uh, my name is um, Josie Howard. I actually come to Hawaii uh, in 1989 um, from Chuk, from a small uh, part of Chuk called Namunwaita Atoll, um, particularly the island of Onon. Um, so I came for to do my education, to further my education, my college education, and after that, um, I've been here since I uh, got my bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, mo moved to Oahu, um, have you know, raised a family, and went back for my master's and in social work. So I'm a social worker by profession. It's wonderful. What a fitting uh, profession for you and for the people of Micronesia that you serve. So, uh, what is your current role right now, uh, professionally? So, right now, I am the program director of uh, this uh, initiative to build a uh, nonprofit for Micronesians uh, by Micronesians called We Are Oceania. So do you mind telling mm -hmm. our viewers a little bit about uh, We Are Oceania, but also in the context of uh, uh, why it is necessary you know, okay. to really uh, create an organization that can support Micronesians yeah. and also to link that with the COFA uh, um, Migration sure. Treaty, uh, but most people don't understand about uh, COFA and yes. How it became, you know, a fact, and that we're at today. Yes. So, uh, yeah. maybe first of all, uh, you know, COFA. COFA is an acronym for the Compact of Free, Free Association, mm -hmm. uh, and it is a treaty between Micronesia, this uh, three nations in Micronesia: Republic of Palau, Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia, mm -hmm. with the United States. So there are three separate treaties that are are called. COVA or mm -hmm. Compact of Free Association. Um, 
So we are Oceania. I mean, we've been uh, here for two years, going on our third year. But prior to that, um, and thank you for asking that question, because prior to that, um, I mentioned that I came to Hawaii in uh, 1989. Mm -hmm. 1986, our Compact of Free Association was signed and went into effect. Mm -hmm. um, so I came here like shortly after the Compact of Free Association was established. Uh, and what that means for me was uh, it gave me you know, free access to come to uh, Hawaii or come to the United States uh, without a visa, just using a passport. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, I was able to seek higher education here, um, uh, able to uh, apply for Bell Grant. There, were, there are certain things that I'm, you know, I cannot access as a COVA citizen, like for example, student loan. But I was able to work and I was able to um, uh, apply for the Bell Grant mm -hmm. uh, to be able to support myself mm -hmm. uh, and, and get my education. Um, and since then, um, we were probably like one of the first big group of Micronesians uh, going to UH Hilo for school. Um, one of the first things that I noticed was uh, us running into a different way of life that was new to us mm -hmm. and that was very different and that we were clashing or like there were certain things that we did that was not you know supposed to be allowed. Um, for example, um, you know, like driving without a driver's license or driving with a seat belt on, that was really new to for me because mm -hmm. back home you don't wear a seat belt mm -hmm. or as long as you know how to drive, you can drive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the law is not as strict as here mm -hmm. um, where you will get pulled over here and you, you know, you'll get a ticket or even show up in court. Um, but um, those were the, the things that I start realizing that uh, people were having cultural shock mm -hmm. uh, as they were coming to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And so uh, s that was something that I kind of, it was a passion of mine because I was also going through the same thing. So I mm -hmm. felt I can help other people because I went through the same process. Mm -hmm. So I became very involved in helping our, my new community, Hawaii, mm -hmm the uh, professionals like teachers and administrators and social workers, uh, social service providers mm -hmm. to understand how to work better with our Micronesian population. Yeah. So and cultural competence also yes, and training exactly. so people could understand, could understand both exactly. sides of the story. Yes, yes. because I, I totally saw a uh, total misunderstanding, a total could be a total misinterpretation mm -hmm. of behavior uh, people might interpret that, oh, they're so rude. Why they act this certain way or why they wear this certain clothes when, you know, but it's because of not knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that became my passion. And um, I just started to really, <laughs> I mean, as I tried to make a living here, I found myself ending up on the other side yeah. trying to help my people. I even left a very secure job. Uh, to become a part-time teacher so I can help the kids at the oh. school. Um, and do you mind telling me what are the barriers that the children of Micronesian faced then and where do you see the improvements and need for you know, yes. more support nowadays? Yes. Uh, I think the biggest barrier for our children who moved to Hawaii and um, you know are seeking education or better education in Hawaii, it's the environment, the differences in environment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the classrooms here, the education system here, even though we follow a U.S. education standard, um, our classrooms, our environment is very different from the environment that they, co they come to find here at the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, back home, our communities are small, so the schools are run or, or um, teachers in the schools are, are our own community members, so their families or uh, sometimes we joke about it like, oh yeah, we couldn't get away with anything because our uncle, the teacher will, you know, we'll like when we, home. exactly, <laughs> like after school they come to us at home, hey, you were really bad in school, whereas here, some of the complaints or some of the questions the teachers were seeking was, you know, you guys talk a lot about respect, but these kids, they don't seem to respect. And I don't think it's not. I don't. I don't think it's. A, it's about respect. I think it's about uh, 
you know, like being not connected mm -hmm. because they don't have any relation with this person who's teaching them. Yes. They don't know this person. He, this person comes from a totally different yeah. uh, cultural background, so there's no connecting. And um, I, so that's then. And I think now what I see is, especially with our youth summit that just happened oh. this past uh, Saturday, I mean, the schools were helping the kids come. And I feel the kids are now feeling part of it, feeling connected, feeling a uh, sense of belonging, feeling mm -hmm. a sense of there's a space and we belong in that space. That's so wonderful to hear that yeah. uh, in so many years, you know, you already yes. have that sense of belonging and acceptance. Yes. And also there's the part uh, of uh, equity and diversity, not only mm -hmm. in the school body in terms of the teachers, but mm -hmm, also mm -hmm. the curriculum development, oh, which yes. uh, hopefully that has also include is more inclusive now to um, have Micronesian children feel that they have an identity there with uh... Uh, and I think part of that was when I first started out uh, in helping the schools uh, there were no Micronesians working mm -hmm. in the schools. so mm -hmm. one of the suggestion I suggested was to hire Micronesians because mm -hmm. just a, just a face can totally make the child feel connected yeah. or the language can make the child feel connected and I will never forget this uh, this um, story or experience I had at the school I worked at, there was a student who was very new, and that was his very first day at school. Um, they called because this student would not stop crying and throwing a tantrum. And so the teachers were like, oh, these kids, they, you know, we're going to control him and da-da-da. So I showed up at the scene. I walked over. Uh, the student was faced away from me, but when I came from the back and I, I said, um, hi, may I help you? What's going on? Why are you crying in, in Chuki's language? Chukis. He stopped totally. I mean, like from escalation to, you know, the escalation and mm -hmm. just like he stopped and he turned and looked at me and he goes, uh, he goes, you know, like his face, you can see that he was calmed and he was, he felt secure reassured, and yeah, yeah. reassured. Yes. And I asked, and then I followed with another question. I said, I said, why are you crying? And he said, Oh, because she spoke to me and I didn't understand what she was telling me. Simple, that was it. Something but so he simple. was throwing a tantrum. Yeah. But, and yeah. his inability to be able to really express himself yes. and also exactly. still in that part of social yes. emotional development, yes. you know, as a child. Yes. And I think even as an adult, you know, that you know, anyone who has tried to learn a foreign yes. language or to have any kind of immersion yes. uh, program had had moments of wanting to throw a tantrum or frustrated because we're trying our best. Exactly. And uh, and uh, and sometimes that's not enough because yeah. there's not enough time, enough longevity yes. to be able to really assimilate all of the cultural norms yeah. and the language in exactly. a way that we can express ourselves. So that's really a very powerful story. And, uh, you know, you lived through that. You were one of the first uh, members, groups that came here from Micronesia. Mm -hmm. And look at you now as a beautiful, amazing leader. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but you know, one of the things I want to ask you, mm -hmm. um, we might have to elaborate that a little yes. bit further later. It, it's the misconception that I think American culture and mm -hmm. some people from the state of Hawaii may have about Micronesian that they don't understand the resiliency and the beauty and the similarities between oh, yes. a Pacific Islander culture yes. and Hawaiian culture and actually to even go back, trace yes. back history yes. that the seafarers, you know, from Micronesia yes. and uh, from that region of the Pacific Islands and actually arrived here so our aloha yes. spirit comes yes. from you know yes. a different route and that uh, um, I mean I, I, there are many but I think one that stood out to me is uh, like that we're not driving people we you know like we don't um, it's like we we're, we're not um, we're here but we're not uh, trying our best to be, you know, mm -hmm. to do better, mm -hmm. uh, or where we don't have, uh, you know, like skills, like for example, work skills. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's such a misconception because, uh, like, our people, they have so much skills and they have so much work ethics. Mm -hmm. 
but in in our own different way. Our it's on it's on it's on in our own cultural cultural way. Yes. And the way I see it is that we were like the Hawaiians how many years ago. Mm -hmm. but so let's let's pause really quickly for a little yes. break and I want to okay. start our show the second segment okay. uh, to talk more about that. Okay. And, and uh, we're going to dive right in. Okay. Right. So. Aloha. You can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host Matthew Johnson here with Justine Espirito. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. So welcome back to Perspectives of uh, Global Justice. And then here we're back with Josie. Mm -hmm. So Josie, we were talking uh, about um, the misconceptions mm -hmm. that a lot of people carry about the uh, uh, culture and the people of Micronesia, mm -hmm. uh, and also the resentment of the Kofa Treaty mm -hmm. and the history that's mm -hmm. not well known. Mm -hmm. And so you were talking about the work ethics and the strength and the resiliency of Micronesian yeah. people and how they function way back home. So maybe the level of development where we come from in terms of like, you know, becoming westernized or modernized. Mm -hmm. um, I also see, um, you know, people think that we just come here to, you know, to leave off the welfare and, uh, but actually a lot of us don't want to be here. <laughs> We'd rather be home, but because uh, of the sicknesses that people are getting from the nuclear testing, from our food. And we also, I think just the fact that uh, we see or we're seen as different uh, and not known, uh, that's a really big thing because our story is the same all across with any indigenous group of people, mm -hmm. with any minorities. You know, like our, the history of the Pacific is the same. It's just different way in, in different areas. Mm -hmm. Like for example, Hawaii was, was overthrown. Whereas for us, uh, you know, different, uh, different powerful countries came over and took over our islands. Mm -hmm. uh, some bought out our islands, some just came in and just, you know, got in and took over the whole island and mm -hmm. the whole system. Uh, our relationship with the United States, you know, that's all, you know, very much the same, but it's just in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, our lifestyle was disturbed over time. I mean, we talk about cultural trauma. We also go through our own cultural trauma, mm -hmm. and I think those are things that uh, we're starting to see the effect of. Um, but uh, I think that that misconception of that Micronesians are just here to, you know, take advantage of the system and uh, they're, they're lazy and they, they're dirty, they're backward. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's just a matter of differences in culture, differences mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I arrived in Hawaii two mm -hmm. and a half years ago yes. and uh, my first year I had a lot of connection with the Micronesian yeah. community, unfortunately through Kakako, through the yeah. houseless encampment. Yeah. And I must say that I really learned aloha yes. from uh, the cultural perspective of the first generation yes. immigrants from Micronesia. They were so kind and so giving and they had so much wisdom and yeah. how they cared for each other yes. and their children and the way that they saw the world. And uh, you know, that really has moved my heart uh, in, in a beautiful way. Um, and, and I really think that we, that's, our, that, that's the asset. And I, yes. um, you know, for us, it's an exodus for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it, this is like, like over time I've been wondering, why do we exit? And like, why is this happening to us? You look at the Bible, you see, you know, like people, uh, ex, you know, being removed from their places to become a better people and come back mm -hmm. and, and make, make the place a better place. I feel the same way is happening to us um, and that wherever we go, we are an asset. We bring 
that strength to this existing culture here. You know, coming to Hawaii, and I think what I found really, um, when I learned from my friends, when I met my Hawaiian friends, that's when I started to respect and, and understand what's going on. In, in, in the land of Hawaii. Yes. I, my image of Waikiki and everything changed, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and I began to value my own. And I began to value my own own uh, history. And I started to get interested into why are we here? Why, you know? Mm -hmm. So I changed my major because I had realized that this is more meaningful to me. And it's, it's more meaningful to my, the future generation of my family right. than to be a medical doctor. Yeah. And that, that part uh, of really recognizing the cultural roots and yeah. the indigenous identity, which I think in many ways yes. um, all over the globe, you know, yeah. with uh, the colonization and the whitening yeah. uh, movements that, you know, it's so suppressed. Yeah. Uh, and yet, I, I think in Hawaii, you know, from very few places on earth, mm -hmm. you see the good, the bad, and the ugly mm -hmm. over that. and. Uh, to those who come from indigenous roots, mm -hmm. like yourself, myself, yes. that you may understand that, uh, um, you know, rationally, but you, you really feel it in the heart. Yes. And I think that the call to be able to preserve yes. that and to not only uh, uh, help others yes. understand and respect, but teach the children yes. uh, so that there is continuity and, you know, that there is this reverence and the respect that's necessary, yeah. the revival. Exactly. And that's what I really hope you know, to see happening, you not know, just for Hawaii, yeah. but for all of the indigenous people and the people of Micronesia. Yes. Um, and I mean, if you look at today, um, I think people are moving back. When you talk about sustainability, when you talk about global warming, it, then you started to value things that sustains us naturally. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you know, we're moving into like back home, we moved from our canoes to motorboats. And so we need gasoline for the motorboats. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is there are cultural values that are so critical to our uh, existence in the Pacific mm -hmm. and our, our uh, you know, ourselves that we need to carry on. Mm -hmm. And that's my fear and my concern, that if we lose grip on that because of, uh, you know, like, you know, because there's so much uh, the impact, like fast changing world, that right. we will lose that and we will not be able to revive it. Right. Uh, and so uh, the canoe is a really good example. Mm -hmm. The canoe, you can make it out of any, any natural material. Every part of the canoe, mm -hmm. you don't need any imported material mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. And when you go in the water, you, or when you use it in the water, it may be slow, but it will take you to your destination, and you know, and you can turn it. If it go, I mean, if it capsizes, you can turn it up. Yes. Yeah, and you know how to work it, so it it is sustainable. Whereas a boat, when it sinks, that's it. The machine is gone, and you cannot reach land. And not to uh, mention the environmental impact for the corals exactly, and the fish exactly. and all the the, yeah, the, exactly. the destruction that happens. Exactly. And uh, so, back to we are Oceania. Yeah. Tell us. Uh, <laughs> Vision and mission. Okay, vision and mission. Uh, really, we are Oceania. The vision, the mission of we are Oceania is to empower Micronesians in Hawaii to navigate success, while honoring the di the uh, integrity of our diverse heritage. Mm -hmm. Micronesia is such a diverse area culturally. Uh, you How know, many islands are there in the third? There states of are Malaysia? seven major nations in Micronesia. Marshall Islands alone, I think there are over 229 islands. Oh. These are like islands, you know. Yes. Uh, so there's uh, so there's many, many know. islands. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, so much maybe to over thousands. Yes. yes, there are there are small islands, but our our region, our area is is big. It's actually bigger than the United States, mm -hmm. but it's it's a, a community of of ocean. It's mm -hmm. an ocean that connects us. Yeah, and so. Our core values for We Are Oceania is uh, compassion, unity, um, respect, empowerment, and serving with humility. Uh, and these are the things that we feel is, it identifies who we are and it, uh, it helps us to succeed mm -hmm. in navigating success. 
We have very few minutes left. I can't believe how quick the <laughs> show came to an end. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the essence of the Fast Youth Summit that we just had okay. for Micronesian uh, children and adolescents on the 15th. The Youth Summit, we, our target was 200 students and 100 volunteers plus service providers. Mm -hmm. There were over 300 students showed up. When they showed up, they were charged. I mean, like their energy level was just so high. Uh, it, it was amazing. It was incredible. It was beyond our imagination. It was beyond what we expected. But I think when I asked the kids, what do you feel from this? Um, a lot of them said unity, and that was great for them. Uh, some people would say, you know, these kids, they don't show up to class on time, but they were early today. Um, it really gave me a good uh, feeling or like uh, it gave me that an idea that when you create something that is so great and is so empowering, they will come. Yes. So the kids made it yes, powerful uh, and absolutely. they made it, they made it great. They made it, they made it happen. They did it because without them, the Youth Summit would have been no meaning, no use, but they, they made it. Yeah. yeah, and may this be the faster of yeah. many amazing youth Thank summits, you. and that our youth of Micronesia will be our new leaders. Yes, you know our teachers, yes. our beautiful neighbors, yes. our doctors, our lawyers, yes. our legislatures, yes. our fathers and mothers, and. Uh, that makes this community vibrant. Josie, thank you so very much for your presence here. And I hope to have you many times. Thank and uh, I want to thank our viewers uh, for being here today on Perspectives on Global Justice. We'll be back uh, next Friday at 4 o'clock. So until then, uh, we hope.